Welcome and thank you for joining us for our podcast series, Reimagining Jury Trials, How Virtual Trials Can Proceed. We're going to discuss the experience to date during the pandemic and concepts under consideration for fully virtual and for hybrid virtual in-person jury trials. And we hope this will inspire some creative thinking while also providing some hands-on advocacy tips and also provide a foundation for advising clients with respect to ongoing litigation and strategizing about whether and how those cases may be tried in the months to come. My name is Alan Howard, and I'm joined by my colleague in the Commercial Litigation Group in the New York office of Perkins Coie, Ed Baum. Together we have, I hesitate to say, over 60 years of combined experience, including handling numerous jury trials in state and federal courts across the country. But like most of you, neither of us has ever tried a case to a virtual jury. Fortunately, we are joined by Karen Lisko, one of Perkins Coie's most valuable resources in all respects, but especially now as we face a challenging world of changing jury trials. Karen holds a doctorate in legal communication, which is a specialized degree attained by only a few consultants in the nation. And she draws upon her unique experience and expertise and 30 years of research with judges and juries to strategize with legal teams in civil litigation and to work with attorneys to make them more persuasive. Karen is the author of two books, Patently Persuasive, and Proving Jury Arguments and Evidence. From early during the pandemic, when it became apparent that there would be a prolonged disruption of the legal system, including in particular jury trials, Karen did not concede that jury trials would be impossible during the pandemic, but instead she has focused her attention on how to make virtual trials not only possible, but effective. She is a founding member of the Online Courtroom Project, a national group of social scientists, attorneys, and retired judges who are developing recommended best practices for virtual jury trials. She has also advised the Arizona State Judiciary as part of the Jury Trial and Innovation Task Force. Both groups recently completed online jury simulations, and she will educate us during these podcasts about some of those findings as well as information she gained from interviews with judges and attorneys who've been part of remote jury trials in different parts of the country. And since such interviews are a valuable source of learning, together with Karen, we've conducted interviews ourselves to hear about the virtual trial experience firsthand. We are privileged to include in these podcast sessions discussions with Judge Pamela Gates, who is the chief judge in Maricopa County, Arizona, and she has been instrumental in the Jury Trial Innovation Task Force. Finally. Before diving into the substance, I want to provide a high-level overview of the topics we will cover. In the first episode, we will discuss the current landscape of jury trials during the pandemic and the implications for trials and for client considerations going forward during the remainder of the pandemic and even beyond. Then in the second episode, we will focus on the remote experience from the juror perspective. And in the third episode, with an understanding of the current landscape and how jurors experience remote settings we will discuss trial advocacy in the virtual environment. Ed, why don't you kiss, uh, kick us off? Sure. And before we dig into the yeah. substance of this program, I want to make two very quick points. The first one is to uh, disagree with Alan, which uh, which I often do and enjoy. Um, Alan made reference to the, the notion that we'll be talking about virtual jurors. There's nothing virtual about any juror, even if they're participating by video conference or other technology. Some folks refer to these things as remote jury trials. They might call them a remote juror. And there's nothing remote about a juror, because there should be nothing, at least remote, about the experience of participating in a jury trial. I mean, I think as we all know by now, after, oh, seven, eight months into this pandemic and hundreds of video conferences for all of us, a video conference can feel very intimate. And in some ways, it can feel more up close and personal than even an in-person setting or something as large and perhaps distant as a courtroom. And those observations that the jurors are not remote and that they are participating in a uniquely intimate setting underscore some special challenges that we'll be talking about in this program. We all know that key for a lawyer's success in jury trials is to establish a direct personal connection with the individual jurors. So there can't be anything virtual or remote about it. We've got to create that connection, even if we're talking to them through a microphone and on screen. And in later sessions of this podcast, we'll talk about how to create and maintain that type of connection, even when on video and even when your voice is being broadcast. And we'll discuss ways in which you can even use the technology to improve the advocacy experience over even a live setting. But we're going to start today with a discussion of when 
and how we may be trying those cases, at least for, I'm estimating, the next six and probably 12 months and maybe longer. And I would like to focus as we go through today's session on a practical reality, especially because the courts are so backlogged with the pandemic and the pandemic is surging as we sit here today. There will be relatively few and far, relatively few opportunities for actually trying cases in the next six to 12 months. Most of us We'll talk about jury trials and virtual jury trials. We will hope to get a setting for an actual trial within the next six to 12 months, but we probably won't because the courts are so backlogged. But every one of us who counsels clients on litigation will have to talk with our clients who desperately will want to know about when or even whether their cases can be tried and what those trials will look like. So regardless of whether you think you actually will get a setting for a jury trial in the next six to 12 months, it's critically important, we think, to consider these issues so you can counsel your clients effectively on what they should be expecting over the next, again, half a year to a year with respect to their disputes. When will they be tried? And if so, how will they be tried in the next year? So with that, let me turn it over to our uh, esteemed colleague and guest, Karen Lisko. How are you? Thrilled to have you here, Karen, and to see you. Remotely. Remotely, yes. Or virtually, yes. Yes. Well, it only makes sense if we're going to be talking about the virtual juror, or I like, Ed, how you said the connected juror that we're doing this virtually, too. A lot of things are possible these days. Karen, before we discuss the the topic of the day, the virtual and hybrid virtual in-person jury trials, can you tell us what the current status is with respect to traditional in-person jury trials? Are they happening anywhere in the country now? They have been happening. They've been happening in a slower pace. They, as we know, sitting here today in December, a lot of them have been delayed, but it's been sporadic. So, for example, in some parts of the country, it, for example, Texas, there are judges who have said, we are having jury trials. It's not been left up to the parties. But even in those jurisdictions where there have been a number of trials during the pandemic, those courts have closed down and said that they're delaying for a few months. An order, as a matter of fact, just came out yesterday in the state of Arizona, where they were planning to proceed and had been at least two a week, for example, in federal court, in state court, there were trials happening. They have just issued an order within the last 24 hours saying no state court jury trials are happening until the end of February, the beginning of March. So we're definitely feeling the spike and the courts are following suit. Have you seen any impact of the pandemic on in-person juries in terms of representativeness of the panels? You know, there's some counterintuitive stuff going on. For the in-person jury trials, you wouldn't, of course, be surprised to hear that there are people who are nervous. And we've done some studies across the country about who tends to be more nervous in terms of getting that invite or the summons for the jury trial. And the older juror, of course, who feels more vulnerable is not showing up as much. And ironically, even though we know across the country, certain jurors at a certain age don't have to be jurors. Before the pandemic, they often were still showing up for jury duty because it sounded interesting. It sounded like something that they could do. A lot of those jurors are now not showing up at all. And then we're also finding that the jurors who are in lower socioeconomic situations are also staying away because their concern is they want to stay healthy. They're working jobs. They're working for day to day wages and it's not possible for them to put their, their health at risk. So as a result, the attrition that's happening is affecting representativeness. Well, I see now that, I mean, we're back to a spike and you even mentioned the recent. Um, order in Arizona. We're going to probably see that if we haven't already seen it in uh, most jurisdictions, which will put at least a pause on in-person jury trials. So let's let's move right to the the virtual trial and and maybe give us a little background on 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 what's been going on. And, and, and my first question is: Are virtual trials fact or fiction, or even more accurately, I should ask, science fiction? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, they I have to say, even where they're fact, they feel a little bit like science fiction because there's so much adapting going on. And I have to say, a lot of it comes down to people's belief in what's possible. Because I've heard, as I'm sure a lot of people have heard, a lot of naysayers who are so strong and adamant in saying, this cannot happen. This cannot be viable. I disagree. We've studied it. We've asked jurors questions about their experiences when we've studied it. And the fact is, those who have tried it have made it a fact. In the state of Texas, as early as April, the very first Zoom jury trial happened. Uh, Judge Emily Miskell along with a colleague, presided over the trial. Judge Miskell acted as the technical bailiff. And then on the criminal side, again in Texas, Texas gets a lot of credit for being front runners. On the criminal side, Judge Jonathan Chu presided over the first ever Zoom criminal trial. I got to moderate a panel of both of them a few weeks ago and talk to them about their experience. And it is still going on. They figured out a way, and now it's happening in Arizona. It just happened in California in a nine-week Zoom jury trial. But the fiction still exists, again, a lot for those jurisdictions where there's worry or where there aren't as many resources available. But the fact seems to be gaining traction. And frankly, from having studied it and having the hope for especially right to a speedy jury trial on the criminal side, I certainly hope, and many of my colleagues hope, that we're going to see it take hold and become fact even more. So, so Karen, I think you hit on one of the key factors that we as counselors have to be aware of, which is that we can talk generally about the way in which trials can be conducted remotely, but it really, when we're counseling our clients, it's going to be a very jurisdiction-specific element of advice. I mean, for example, Alan and I are here in, in New York, New York we have unique challenges here in New York that aren't present in some other jurisdictions toward migrating toward remote jury trials. And they include particularly in the city, you were alluding to resource differentials. There are in this densely populated city, there are a surprising number of people who don't have regular broadband access or can't afford regular broadband access and may have limited technology. So there would need to be a need to push out the technology to potential jurors in order to maintain a reasonable jury pool. On the flip side is physical space. We tend to live in very close quarters here in, in New York City and particularly in Manhattan. And if we want jurors to participate remotely, they need a quiet place to do so. And that will create special challenges in this environment, which may not be present in many other parts of the country. And a flip side is to the extent you consider methods of bringing jurors to a central place for a trial, whether it's a hybrid trial or just to put them in a technology room, transportation is more of a challenge in dense urban environments where most people need to rely on public transportation to get around, Don't drive, a, cannot even drive a private car, as opposed to jurisdictions where private cars are possible. So what does this mean for us? As we talk to our clients about what to expect in the next year, we have to be mindful of where we anticipate the dispute being tried, engaging when and how we think it'll be tried. And this may even impact advice to clients on venue choice when they're filing new litigations. If a goal is to get the trial quickly, we may want to focus on, on jurisdictions if we have the option where maybe it's a suburban location with modern courthouse facilities, we're more likely to be able to get a trial setting. Well, and there's a lot of innovation going on around everything you just said, because the thing that's impressed me the most, I've talked to a fair number of judges about this nationwide, and I'm so impressed by how the judiciary, who is often criticized for being glacially slow, has actually been on the front running side of innovating. They are the ones who have been leading the charges in a lot of pilots in a lot of states. And it does make sense because, and just as you described, Ed, in New York, it could be a very different scenario than it is in Wyoming. So the local states are figuring out what are our unique challenges, but it, it's part of what I think about when we even call this the practice of law. It's practice because we're having to flex and figure out how do we address those challenges? How do we practice new skill sets and the ability to be flexible? 
Let me give you one example. On the tech side, it makes complete sense that we all should be laser focused on, are we creating a digital divide because we have younger jurors, lower socioeconomic jurors, those who may not have access, like you said, to broadband or to a laptop. So challenge created solutions. One of the solutions that's taking hold is there are broadband providers who are donating providing grants in certain jurisdictions, and or there are those who are making available tablets or laptops with hotspots embedded. So in other words, everybody's figuring out, okay, what's the barrier? How do we overcome it? And people keep reinventing ways to handle it. So that's why I keep coming back to the naysayer who hasn't tried it yet. Those tend to be the ones with the biggest shield up who say, you can't do this. But I would also point something you said about what does this mean for the advocate? You know, in our third part of this series, we're going to focus on that because it does behoove both sides in a case to determine, do we think we in our case specific to our side have an advantage or a disadvantage being in a virtual setting? Because it looks a whole lot different than it does in person. And there may be upsides in certain scenarios for one side or the other. We could talk about that for an entire hour. So, Karen, if you, if you can overcome the the challenge of getting equal access to the technology to, to make a remote or virtual trial possible into the hands of the perspective and then ultimately the, the final selection, selection of jurors, what about the technology itself, presenting evidence, making that connection? Ed talked about, we find that we've become more proficient in that on a professional to professional basis in this pandemic virtual environment. But connecting with people who are not on Zoom every day like we are, right? Uh, how how is that work? It it's comical and possible. I've I've talked with some judges who said when they take jurors through the tech checks, and again, some of the judges act as their own technical bailiffs in certain jurisdictions, they actually enjoy it. They say that sometimes it's challenging somebody who wants to use his smartphone instead of a computer. So they've got to figure out access, get them a tablet, a bailiff or a sheriff may drive over a laptop to them and then getting them proficient with Zoom. But the funny thing is, depending on the platform a certain judge or jurisdiction is using, that technical bailiff is able to start a bonding process with the prospective juror. So as you mentioned at the top of this, I've been part of some pilot simulations, and a lot of it has been kicking the tires with the jurors on how do we educate you, juror, on how to get your camera set, how to make sure you don't have your cat crawling all over the place. And that's where it gets a little bit comical. Or in the case or in the case of my father-in-law, when we FaceTime, we get to look in his ear. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it, there's something intimate about it. I mean, it's it's probably to me the biggest surprise is that on the technical front for jurors figuring out how do they make this work? And then we get the view of the juror in his or her own home or in their living room, what have you, or, the, or you know, your father-in-law's ear, that that intimacy has actually had upside. It's created candor in a way that none of us expected in terms of getting the, you get the juror over the hump technologically. And for example, Judge Chu told me in the state of Texas that he has figured out a whole tutorial and they've got a handout and they've got a shtick in terms of how they get the juror proficient and that they've actually been impressed that you know, people might think you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but some of these older jurors really enjoy it. And we've figured out, even in our online mock trials that we do at Perkins, that there are ways to educate that kind of a mock juror who people would have just counted out and they shouldn't. They People are adaptable. They're figuring it out. You know, it really is just a variant of the age-old core challenge of a jury, which is that you have a broad range of experience among these six to 12 people, whatever the number is, and you have to adapt your presentation and your case to suit that broad range of experiences. Now, in addition to education, life experiences, attention span, all those other variables, now we have to also input 
technological prowess. Though I will posit that it's probably more feasible today than it would have been six or eight or nine months ago, because for so much of the population, people have become more comfortable, at least with the technology than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. And for us as lawyers, we've all been taking baby steps along the way the last few months between getting comfortable with video conference oral arguments or court conferences and depositions and whatnot, not yet trials, but still baby steps with many of the same techniques we will use in trial. So I think we're better positioned today than we were last spring to make this shift. We have, I mean, think about it. We have really learned at a quick pace. I call this procedural inevitability. You know, it's accelerated learning of a new skill set. And it's also taught (laughs) through some foibles. It's taught judges and lawyers about what they have to admonish jurors about now that they're in the comfort of their own home rather than collected in a jury box. For example, one of the very first civil jury trials, the judge had to tell a juror to get off his phone during jury selection. You know, he took a phone call as the as the questions were being asked. Another juror stood up and was walking around the room. And so, you know, lesson learned. So the next jury trial that was virtual, that judge had embedded in the instructions, please don't take a phone call during your, any point in the trial. We know that you've got a refrigerator in the next room. Please don't stand up and go get a snack during opening statement. But I get to study jurors for a living. I've interviewed thousands of jurors over the years. And the more I interview jurors, the more I respect them. And I fully respect the flexibility and the desire of the virtual juror to still do the right thing. So if they're given good guidance, for the most part, jurors are going to align with what they need to do and do their level best, just as they do when they're live in an actual courtroom. So Karen, let me ask you this. You, you've obviously talked with a lot of trial lawyers in your career as well. I have. <laughs> and I, From the perspective of the trial lawyer, the technological challenge and establishing that intimacy with the jury, but simultaneously having to focus on witnesses uh, when you're live in a courtroom, one of the things that we become uh, adept at is uh, engaging with the witness, but also keeping in mind and being aware of jury reaction. So you can, I- in real time, understand what uh, how the evidence is going over with the jury. How can you recreate that in effectively a two-dimensional screen remote environment? That is... The right question, because this has been one of the biggest counterintuitive surprises of our research. We have actually found that it can be better virtually. Here's what I mean. Think about a Zoom screen and gallery view. Now you have front row seat to seeing the face of every juror watching you as the litigator watching the the examination of the witness, and the witness takes up as much space in gallery view, although some can vary it, so there's a bigger use of real estate for the questioner and the witness. The judge's view is there as well. So one of the biggest surprises we got when we did this research was that we found that jurors liked being able to be in the virtual setting more than in the courtroom because they could see the witness, the expressions of the witness, they could see the face of the attorney, they were no longer looking around or behind. And for the attorney, you don't always, you often have your back to the jury or the jury is to your side during examination. Now, everybody sees everybody watching everybody. And jurors express greater connection when we interview them after these mock simulations in what was going on during the witness examination. They also said, surprisingly, or maybe not so, since many of us have squinted at screens so long in in jury trials, that they could see the exhibits and the demonstratives better. So big surprise, there's actually been an improvement in what jurors have been reporting in these virtual trials as they watch a witness. And we even, um, one, one case that we tested was one where the witness was emotional and we were testing her crying 
who was in a harassment case and she was crying and she had a mask on in one of the tests and then she had no mask on but a plexiglass shield in front of her in the other test. And jurors said, we could still tell she was emotional. No, we didn't like that she was wearing a mask, but we could still hear so much through her use of her voice. We could still see her eyes and her stress. And the fact that she was close up on the screen made that more well, actually, I'm morphing it because she was wearing a mask during the in person simulation. Obviously, she didn't need to wear a mask during the virtual. But in some hybrid trials, there's a two level experience. Hybrid jury trials that that are being tested have some jurors in the courtroom, and therefore the witness does have to either have plexiglass or a mask. And some same part of the same jury are in the comfort of their own home or some other location if they don't have access to a quiet place. So it's actually counterintuitively an improvement in some ways where a lot of attorneys have been quite concerned that there would be a a decrease in the ability for it to be effective. Well, we're going to turn to hybrid trials in a bit, but Ed, I want to ask you, hearing all this and um, the lessons that Karen has learned. What do you think see as the implications for our clients as we talk to them about even the potential of jury trials in this remote environment? Well, we're going to have to give them choices and they're going to want us to present them with choices, which is in, in a typical setting or typical case, do they want to ask for a bench trial when they normally would ask for a jury trial if they have that option? Knowing that with a bench trial, the chances are they'll be able to get a trial sooner and the mechanical aspects are easier to manage when your audience is really an audience of one, a judge, as opposed to managing a jury. So that it's going to change the calculus in that decision somewhat, bench versus jury. Number two, if they want a jury trial, are they going to push to have it done within the next, I'm going to keep using this time frame because I think it's the relevant one, six to 12 months when it probably will have to be remote or at least some fairly tech-driven form of hybrid, or will they allow their dispute to, in fact, sit trial ready for another year until we have a full resumption, potentially, of jury trials? These are going to be challenging tactical decisions. Well, let me ask you, Karen, That that ra- what Ed just said raises a question to me. You're studying, you're part of these working groups that's doing simulations and and then speaking with judges who've actually held remote trials. So you know, and you're speaking to the possibility and the very real possibility of doing them. But how widespread and, uh, and how much traction do you think this will gain among judges across the country where what Ed is describing as a choice will actually be a choice or would judges more likely say to civil litigants, if you want a trial in the next 12 months, you've got to agree to a bench trial. We're not going to be giving jury trials in the next 12 months. The big fat answer is it depends. It depends on how much work a certain jurisdiction has already been doing to kick the tires on virtual jury trials. The ones who have been pushing forward, trying different approaches, in my experience in talking with them, have said, this is actually possible. The ones who are more resistant, and believe it or not, the greater resistance seems to be coming from the trial lawyers, not so much the trial judges, because a lot of the trial lawyers are saying, I don't like this. I don't like that I'm no longer in the courtroom three-dimensionally sensing the emotion and reading the room. So there's a lot of adjustment that Some are resisting, not everybody, but some are. So what I keep hearing from judges is it's either a jurisdiction where they say, you are going to move forward in this mode. I've already mentioned Texas, where prior to a few weeks ago, at least in certain federal jurisdictions, the judge said, you'll be here and you'll be here in person and the jury will be here in person. Same state, state level. The judges are saying, you'll be here, it'll be virtual, and we are requiring it. We're not asking if you would like to agree, it's happening. In Arizona, the state court is now saying, if the parties both agree that they want to do virtual, we'll do it. 
but that's not true of every judge. So it's so yeah. jurisdiction and even judge specific. But I have also heard judges saying, you know, we are encouraging bench trials as a viable alternative. Judge Miskell, who I mentioned, the first judge to preside over a Zoom jury trial, said she has tried 120 bench trials since March. 120. So she's busy. <laughs> I'm not sure if she sleeps, but she, she, I have to believe that there are others like her in other parts of the country. And as an aside, even where the jury trials are happening, the peremptory challenges are shrinking because they're, and that's more in this in-person setting, because they don't want to have to call as many prospective jurors. So one remedy is they're calling fewer prospective jurors and allowing fewer peremptory challenges. So there's a lot going on. We should take a pause at the moment just to note an implicit bias in our presentation. Alan and I are both civil litigators. And Karen, I think, supports civil trial work much more so than criminal trial work. Uh, well, they do some criminal. So to some degree, to our audience, when you're hearing this discussion, it's through the lens of civil trial lawyers. Obviously, the challenges of conducting jury trials are so much greater and the stakes are, one could argue, so much higher in the criminal setting where the right to a jury trial is constitutionally sacrosanct, one could say. And there are also further constraints, depending on the jurisdiction, on the timing of trial, on the speed to get to trial, whether it's federal or most states have some form of speedy trial act equivalent. So a lot of the considerations we're talking about will translate only loosely to the criminal setting. And that may be also, I think, the area where I know the courts in New York, at least, proceeded a little more cautiously with criminal jury trials than civil, in part because the stakes were so much higher on the criminal side and individual liberty. But it may be as we move through the next phase of jury trials in light of the pandemic that we start to see greater attention on the criminal side because you can't postpone criminal trials indefinitely. And there is that absolute right. There's a true tension there, too, because, of course, we want to protect right to a speedy trial. And at the same time, I've talked with some judges on the criminal bench who have said, look, I can't in good conscience recommend a civil criminal jury trial if the physical evidence is crucial to determination of guilt or innocence. And Judge Gates said to me, if, you, if the color of the sweater matters immensely, I don't know that that's going to translate in a virtual setting. So the, the, Judges are concerned, rightly, that they want to make sure that it's a fair proceeding, whether it's criminal or civil, but because physical evidence can be so crucial mm -hmm. to that determination of guilt or innocence, there's a think twice mentality to can we easily convert just every single criminal trial into a virtual mode? Well, Karen, that's a fascinating point you just raised because while it doesn't happen that often, it still happens periodically, that some form of live physical demonstration or even, dare I say, theatrics plays a role in, in a trial. Perhaps the most memorable one from Hollywood, which was unfortunately mentioned recently, was the scene in My Cousin Vinny with the tape measure when, <laughs> when Joe Pesci pulls a tape measure to the back of the courtroom. Uh, but th these events do occur in trials, and that will be something that will be challenging to translate into a, uh, a remote or virtual setting. And it's, again, to the, to the extent the lawyer has optionality in when and what form of trial they'll engage in, that's a factor they have to consider. Is that something that's going to be so crucial to their trial experience that they have to preserve a setting in which they can do it live and have their demonstration, their theatrics? Right. Well, and while well, 100% won't translate I think a higher percentage than we might think could in the virtual setting. I'm working on a patent case right now where the patent litigator is going to be making his entire case to a judge virtually, and he knows he wants to do demonstration with a physical device. So it takes, again, hearkening on practice of law, practicing a new skill set for him to be able to figure out what is his lighting? How does he hold it up? How does he make sure that the judge on the screen sees what the attorney himself is holding three-dimensionally? It's possible, but it takes flexing your mental muscle and practicing, practicing, practicing to make sure that it conveys what he wants it to convey since he can't just hand the device physically to the judge. 
Same is true if there is a jury as well. And and why I believe, and I know a lot of trial technologists have weighed in about this in the Zoom trial setting, that so much now needs to be reimagined in animations if they're possible, which are becoming much more affordable and accessible these days. Figuring out another way to share your screen like so many of us are doing in video conferences and making a concept come to life two-dimensionally rather than three-dimensionally. So, Karen, you mentioned earlier that encouraging trial lawyers to get out of their comfort zone and be open to the idea of virtual jury trials has been a challenge. Um, On the other hand, as you just pointed out, there are aspects of what we do that require some real creative thinking and the creativity of presentation of evidence and building a case is what attracts so many of us to, to this area of the law. So I would imagine there is a uh, an excitement to the challenge of being creative in a virtual way to make that connection with virtual jurors and present a case well and in a fashion that's that's persuasive in an entirely virtual environment. I think it's cool. I mean, I think it's a moment of opportunity and it's doable. And even better, there are those who are doing it. So for those litigators who have not, there are ways to learn from those who have already tried and failed and tried again and adapted. And I'm even seeing this in the judiciary. When I've talked with judges, they've said, oh, we're talking to each other nationwide. You know, we're we're finding out in our state what judges who are already a few steps ahead of us are doing so that we can learn instead of trying to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. So instead of being frozen in fear of we don't want to try it, we're worried it's going to affect our client, what if we don't know what we don't know, there is opportunity, and that's part of what we're doing in the online courtroom project, we're trying to coalesce a lot of the lessons learned in different parts of the country and put them into best practices. So we don't have to keep learning from scratch. There are things we can cheat, so to speak, and and pick up what other people have learned the hard way. And maybe our, our ability to do it the easier way is just to get smarter earlier. So I think I see an opportunity for a new type or variant of uh, trial consultant. <laughs> It'll be the cinematographer. <laughs> yeah, someone who can coach us on how to better present our cinema. I mean, even if you look at the example I gave from my cousin Vinny, that was, after all, a film. Right. So that demonstration was not done in a live courtroom. It was done on film. Why not convert Correct. that to a virtual trial environment? Great point. And that's that's who's highly employed these days, by the way, trial technologists. They are also part of our group, our working group, and they are busily helping attorneys figure out how to put the trial on via Zoom or and this is where it gets a little comical, but creative. There are still some in-person trials going on. For example, I was just talking to a colleague about the state of Washington where the judge had to find a bigger space and he moved the trial into a high school gymnasium. So I asked the trial technologist, I'm like, are you getting in some free throw shooting on the brakes? How is that going? Because they had to even connect up the microphone system through the PA. So consider a high school basketball game through a PA announcer. Now that's what they're using for the trial. But the point is they got creative. They're making it work. Trials are proceeding. So speaking of creative, how uh, we've mentioned the term hybrid several times. What are the different variations of hybrids? that we're seeing? There's, a, I, I know about three of them. There's one where it could be a hybrid where the attorneys and the judge are in the courtroom and all the jurors are remote. It could be a hybrid mix within a given jury where some jurors are in person in the courtroom, but others are remote. And you can even add that the ones who are remote are sometimes remote in their home or in a nearby government building where they're spaced apart because they don't have a quiet place to be able to proceed as a, as a juror. And then there can be a hybrid mix of witnesses. And that to me is something uh, I believe will not go away down the road once we've got the pandemic under control, where you may have, assume it's an in-person jury trial. So 
most everybody is there using social distancing and pe- personal protective equipment. But some witnesses don't appear in person. They appear live, but they appear remotely. And that is something I've also heard a few judges say that they actually like. Because think about cases where that was never contemplated. And so the trial setting moved because it was a key witness and the witness was out of the country or the witness was not well enough to travel, but might have been well enough to testify. So it makes it possible to use a hybrid approach where it's still a a live event, but people are showing up either in three-dimensional attire or two-dimensional video. Well, Karen, isn't there another element of hybrid? I think we've talked about it in the past, which is in jury selection. Uh, because in, in many jurisdictions, if not most, the largest body of people collected together in the trial process is jury selection. When you're going to have a veneer that can, eat, depending on jurisdiction, be 50, 100. Or I've been in jury rooms where we've had 500 people in New York collected in a single, pardon the expression, cattle call. But, but that in, in the era of COVID, that creates special challenges because it's almost impossible to physically distance. Can technology and remote technology be used to at least separate the jurors or the prospective jurors during the selection process, even if 6, 8, 12, or 14 with alternates is brought into the court for the actual trial when they can be spread out in a large courtroom? Right. Yeah, I was just part of a jury selection last month in federal court. And we were going to whittle down to a jury of eight. The court did a really thorough job before anybody even showed up in the courthouse of vetting those who had hardship issues, of course, COVID concerns or vulnerabilities. So part of it is being solved in advance. And that is also something that is likely to stick. And I know we'll talk about some of that in part two of this podcast. But they had chosen the largest ceremonial courtroom in the courthouse to put 38 physical prospective jurors. And so we were surrounded. I was sitting at council table. We were surrounded in a U shape by those 38 jurors in a massive courtroom. But the same thing is happening in convention centers. There are some states where they have rented out convention space for jury selection or community centers in rural areas, that's happening. A church or two is being used where you start out with the larger pool and you keep narrowing it down. And then once the jury is selected, you go to a courtroom. But even if you've got a pretty large space, a lot of judges are batching jury selection if it's an in-person trial. So they'll bring in a panel of 12 to 20 a few times over the course of a day or a few days, and they'll keep whittling down until they get enough of a veneer so that everybody can start exercising their peremptory strikes. So yet again, this is what I think is cool about this. People are figuring it out. They're coming up with imaginative ways to try to get access to justice. And it's happening differently in different states, but all to the end of trying to get these jury trials continuing. So, Karen, let me ask you this. You mentioned before at least one thing that you see continuing after the pandemic and when we're roughly back to normal, and that is uh, witnesses being presented remotely. And I can tell you I've actually had that experience in years pre-pandemic where we've had occasions where witnesses have had to testify by video. And that's worked pretty well, although I would say we're probably better equipped now technology-wise and experience-wise to handle such testimony. But are there other aspects of the virtual completely or hybrid virtual uh, jury trial that we may see for the foreseeable future, even after the pandemic? I think so. I've heard many judges say outside the jury arena for now that they don't see a reason why in many hearings that used to last 15, 20 minutes and people traveled, the attorneys traveled from all over the country, why they need to do that in the future, that they could easily, now that we've mastered Zoom, which is, by the way, the preferred platform by the majority of courts, at least right now, that's changing because others are getting in the game of creating tailored courtroom platforms. But right now, our research has found that Zoom is the predominant 
platform. But while we're conversant with it, now that seems to be a viable alternative even post-pandemic. But back into the jury trial setting, it's also making access to justice for jurors more possible. Here's what I mean. In a counterintuitive way, you know, we've already talked about the fact that why would we continue with a virtual jury trial if we don't have to, especially if jurors don't have access to hardware and broadband? But Judge Miskell in Texas said that she found a doubling of the jurors who show up for jury duty virtually versus in person. Why? Because it was possible in more rural areas, for example. A judge in the northern part of Arizona who, with whom I was on a panel just yesterday said that some of their jurors have to travel five hours to get to the courthouse for jury duty. And she said, we're so encouraged now because we would excuse those jurors, you know, if there wasn't, you know, the ability or the money to put them up in a hotel, if it was a long trial. So if we do see the virtual jury trial take hold, it may become a remedy for allowing more participation of jurors. And again, those who might have fervent desire to be a juror, but who just don't feel like they can have the health ability to show up in court post pandemic. I don't mean concern about pandemic, but they might be concerned about, you know, their, their vulnerability to getting ill in other ways or that they need access to facilities or they need to take certain breaks and be near their home, that that is actually making that kind of juror someone who might be able to hope to participate if this sticks. Yeah, I've seen jurors be excused because of child care issues, and that might be eliminated be, uh, if they take the commute out of the process. I've also had one case where in the fifth week of a jury trial, a woman who had been sitting there listening to all the evidence for five weeks had to be dropped because she was in a minor traffic accident on the way into uh, in, in, and she was going to end up being an hour or two hours late again because of the commute. And if there was a, a remote option, she could have stayed part of the jury. That's a great point because something else that's happened is out of necessity now, but maybe as an option post pandemic, there are trials that started out in person and midway through went remote. Now, think about that. If in the past, we never even had remote on our mind, something that created a real barrier midway through trial could cause a suspension of the trial. Now, it might be a viable alternative to turn it remote. And even for individual jurors, because, uh, again, another judge told me that they gave the option to their jury recently to either be remote or in person, so hybrid. And the one juror who decided she wanted to be in person was their 90-year-old juror. And then, so she's the only juror in the courtroom. Wow, that's commitment. And then she decided partway in, it was a little bit tiring. So she dis she opted this 90-year-old juror to go into the Zoom world among her fellow other jurors who had been Zooming all along, and they got her up to speed, got her technologically trained. People are flexible. People are adaptable. And the trial went on. But at, at a different phase in the uh in the life cycle, uh, Alan alluded to something that is cutting in both directions, really, which is childcare. Because today, with I think many, if not perhaps most schools now back on remote teaching, that would create an extra challenge, I would imagine, for parents with school age kids to serve as remote jurors because they've got that additional obligation and distraction in their home. On the other hand, when we return closer to normalcy and kids are back in school, it may be that much easier for potential jurors with school age kids to, to work remotely because the kids will be out of the house. They'll be in school. Right. Well, it's and it's a strange dynamic. And yeah. there is some downside to currently the virtual jury trial when it comes to child care, because Judge Gates will tell you that she has done research with thousands of jurors and found she asked could you serve from home? And in her study of thousands of prospective jurors, 62% said they could. But for the 38% who said they could not, there was a higher proportion of female caregivers who said they could not because they didn't have a way to be interruption free during 
a remote jury trial while they were in their home. So again, that demand or that challenge is going to create some hope for a solution or a reason to say we've got to figure out again how do we get access for that population so that we are getting representativeness on the jury. But it is a challenge right now. I think for us to think about going forward is it means we all recognize that various factors create a jury pool that, let's be frank about it, is not completely representative of a cross-section of any geographic area. And the remote context may just change the mix, but you still may have distortion, shall we say, from what would be a true cross-section caused by personal circumstances. And they, they're just different now. Yeah. My, my guess, my guess, though, Ed, would be, you know, while we're in the pandemic, we've already identified factors that would skew the demographics of an available jury pool. But I think that if we do have the remote option post-pandemic, we very much may see a more representative sample of uh, prospective jurors who are available if we have that option. Well, we're at the end of this first installment of our podcast regarding virtual trials, but it really is not the end because the picture has been changing so constantly for the past nine, 10 months with regard to the pandemic and how courts are adopting. And I think our first installment should be viewed as just that, a start, and we'll be picking up on these topics again and again. See you in the next.